Okay, great. Well, I want to start out by thanking Roland for organizing this and for inviting me to speak here. I'm going to be telling you about how we've been integrating electronic and nuclear quantum effects with the nuclear electronic orbital approach. So nuclear quantum effects are important throughout chemistry and biology in terms of zero point energy and vibrationally excited states, in terms of hydrogen bonding, in terms of hydrogen tunneling, and my personal favorite, uh, proton coupled electron transfer, or PCET, where at least one electron and one proton are, tr are transferring simultaneously, often between different donors and acceptors. And PCET is, in, is essential for many biological and chemical processes, including photosynthesis, solar energy conversion, and, and, and many, many more uh, processes. So over the past 25 years or so, my group has been developing a general theory for PCET. And we treat the transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically and describe the reaction in terms of electron-proton vibronic states. And what we found is most of these reactions are non-adiabatic, so they're non-born Oppenheimer. And we've derived rate constant expressions in various uh, well-defined regimes, and then we've applied this uh, theory to a wide range of, of different systems. So some of these systems are shown here. You can see uh, soybean lipoxygenase. This is an enzyme that uh, exhibits a very high kinetic isotope effect of around 80 for wild type at room temperature and around 700 for a double mutant. And this is a clear hallmark of hydrogen tunneling and of non-adiabaticity. We've also looked at proton wires, where we can get up to four protons to transfer simultaneously upon removal of an electron. This is important in bioenergetics, to translocate protons over long distances. And we've studied CH bond activation, and we've studied PCET at photoreduced zinc oxide nanocrystals. We've also studied electrochemical PCET and photoinduced PCET in these triads the charge recombination reaction exhibits inverted region behavior where the thermodynamically more favorable reaction is actually slower. And this was, actually, this was done uh, in collaboration with Leif Hammerstrom's group here at this university. We've also studied photoinduced PCET in the bluff photoreceptor, which is relevant to optogenetics, and to ribonucleotide reductase, which is essential for DNA synthesis. So in our applications of PCET to these systems, we found that treating the transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically and including hydrogen tunneling, excited vibronic states, and non-born Oppenheimer effects is absolutely essential to being able to reproduce experimental data and understand what it all means. We've also studied non-equilibrium dynamics of PCET in many of these systems, and what we'd like is we'd like a method that will allow us to calculate those vibronic states that we need for our analytical PCET theory and to allow us to do these kinds of dynamical calculations while quantizing the protons. And all of this is really just motivation for the development of this nuclear electronic orbital or NEO method. So in this approach, we treat specified nuclei quantum mechanically on the same level as the electrons using either DFT or wave function theory. So what we're doing is we're solving a mixed nuclear electronic time independent or time dependent Schrodinger equation. We've developed NEO DFT, Neo TDDFT for excited states. We've developed a couple cluster methods and equation of motion methods for excited states, uh, multi reference methods, and pretty much any acronym you have in quantum chemistry. In principle, we can do it with NEO. So the point of NEO is that we want to include these uh, nuclear quantum effects and non born Oppenheimer effects into quantum chemistry calculations in a computationally efficient way and also into the dynamics. So we've studied water clusters where all of the protons are quantized. We've studied uh, melanaldehyde where we can look at the hydrogen tunneling splittings. We've studied uh, photo-induced single and double proton transfer reactions. We've even studied a TiO2 water interface with quantized protons. So what I'm going to do in this talk, I'm going to start out uh, just uh, covering the basic principles of NEO, and I'm going to talk about some of the methods we've been developing recently and some of the applications. So I'm going to interweave applications in theory throughout, throughout the talk. So standard quantum chemistry calculations invoke the Born-Oppenheimer separation between electrons and nuclei. So for each nuclear configuration, we solve the time-independent Schrodinger equation for the electrons, and we get an energy, and then we can map out a potential energy surface. Now, I label these nuclei classical, but in fact, they don't have to move classically. They could move quantum mechanically on the potential energy surface. We could even include non-adiabatic effects with surface hopping or some other such method, but all of it is really in the framework of electronic potential energy surfaces. 
So in NEO, what we do is we say, let's shift this line. Let's move some of the light nuclei, the protons, onto the other side and treat them quantum mechanically on the same level as the electrons. So we remove the Born-Oppenheimer separation between the electrons and these protons. So now if we look at the Neo-Hamiltonian, it consists of the standard electronic terms, so the kinetic energy of the electrons, the interaction of the electrons with the classical nuclei, and the electron-electron repulsion. But then we also have those terms for the protons. So we have the kinetic energy of the protons, the interaction of the protons with the classical nuclei, and the proton-proton interaction. And then we also have the electron-proton attraction term. So now, if in the time-independent Schrodinger equation, our wave function depends explicitly on the coordinates of the electrons and the quantum protons, and parametrically on the classical nuclei. So now our potential energy surface is reduced dimensional. It depends only on the classical nuclear coordinates. And they're no longer electronic surfaces, they're in fact mixed, vibronic surfaces. So with that in mind, we think about what the, what the simplest uh, neo wave function is going to be, and that's Hartree-Fock, right? It's just going to be the product of an electronic and a nuclear Slater determinant. These determinants are made up of electronic and nuclear orbitals, which can then be expanded in Gaussian basis sets. So we had to, de we had to develop proton Gaussian basis sets. That was done uh, long ago, but the most recent ones are, are probably the most effective ones. These are just like SPDF and so forth, but they're more, they're going to be more localized than the electronic counterparts. Once we have these Slater determinants, we just minimize the energy, according to the variational theorem, with respect to the electronic and nuclear molecular orbitals. And then we get two set of coupled Hartree-Fock roton equations, one for the electrons, and one for the quantum protons. These are very strongly coupled because the Fock operators, both the electronic and the nuclear, depend on both the electronic and the nuclear coefficients. So we need to solve these, iteratively solve them self-consistently. And this is actually very easy to implement. The problem is we have an inadequate treatment of electron-proton correlation. Now because electron and proton attract each other, their opposite sign, this correlation is very strong, and it's absolutely essential to getting anything even qualitatively meaningful. So one way to include this correlation is to use wave function methods, like couple cluster methods. So we could just operate on our Hartree-Fock wave function with this exponential of the cluster operator. This cluster operator here consists of the single and double electronic excitations and the single and double protonic excitations, and then we have a double electron-proton excitation. So we've derived and implemented NEO-CCSD and all of these various orbital-optimized uh, counterparts. And we've also developed, in fact, CCSDT, where we include triples, electron-electron proton excitations. And all of these methods provide accurate proton densities, proton affinities, and optimized geometries. And the advantages is there's no parameterization. They're systematically improvable by just adding more excitations. But of course, the problem is they're expensive. Now, the this, this cheapest one of these is the NEO-OOMP2. That's an orbital-optimized second-order perturbation theory. But it's also the least accurate, so that's a bit of a problem. But one way we can get around that is we can take inspiration from Stefan Grimma and Martin Hedgordon, who developed SOS, uh, their scaled opposite spin methods for electronic structure theory. And what we did is we said, let's use their scaling factors for the same and opposite spin uh, electron spin and introduce one additional scaling factor for electron-proton correlation. And what we find is this new method, this SOS prime OOMP2, approaches NEO-CCSD accuracy, but it scales as n to the fourth. So that's a, that's a huge benefit. It's, it's much cheaper. And this allows us to look at larger systems. So we can look at, for example, protonated water clusters with up to 15 quantum protons. And so what you see down here, these are protonated water tetramers. And it turns out that if you look at the relative energies of these isomers, with just electronic structure, CCSD parentheses T, so that's expensive. But if you look at the electronic energies, you get this red curve. They go up in energy from left to right. Now, if we add the anharmonic zero-point energy, it changes the ordering of these energies, this blue curve here. Now, with NEO, we don't have to do, in, in the case of getting to get this blue curve, to add this anharmonic zero-point energy, we had to di diagonalize a Hessian, very expensive, and, and add some sort of second-order vibrational perturbation theory. So it's, it's hugely expensive. For NEO, all we need to do is a single-point energy calculation. We don't need a Hessian because it automatically includes the anharmonic zero-point energy. So you can see we just did single-point NEO-CCSD calculations, or SOS prime, OOMP2, and we get these two lines here. And we are reproducing then the correct ordering that includes the anharmonic zero-point energy. 
Now we can go on with the Neo o o uh, SOS prime OOMP2 and look at larger clusters. And here's a protonated hexamer. And this, this example really emphasizes how important anharmonicity is in this case. Because if you just do MP2 plus harmonic zero point energy, you get that this left isomer is greater in energy than the right one. If you do Neo, you get that the, the ordering reverses. And that's because of anharmonicity. It actually changes the energy ordering compared to just a harmonic zero point energy. Now, if we want to get excited states, we can do equation of motion CCSD. So we've derived and implemented this in both the frequency and time domains. And we've applied it to HCN. So we can look at all the vibrations of the, of the hydrogen. And you can see this, is, this, is the, this peak is the bend mode. It's doubly degenerate. Here we have a stretch mode. We can get combination bands. So this is a double bend. We can get overtones. We can get, even get double excitations from the, uh, the simultaneous excitation of an electron and a proton, these blue lines right here. So again, it works, works great, but it's expensive. We want to do on-the-fly dynamics. And we're probably not going to be able to do that with this method right now. So this is why we turned then to multi-component density functional theory. So this is just density functional theory for more than one type of particle. In this case, we have electrons and protons. And so the multi-component hohenberg cone theorems were derived way back in 1982 by Parr and coworkers. This just tells us that the total energy will be a functional of both one particle densities, rho e and rho p in our case. And then you can use the cone sham formalism. You just have the products of electronic and nuclear slater determinants as your reference. You just derive all the equations. It's very straightforward. The energy functional is the sum of these terms listed here. It's the, uh, we have the uh, interaction of rho e and rho p with the external potential. That's the classical nuclei. We have a term that includes all the non-interacting kinetic energies of the uh, electrons and quantum protons, and all of the classical Coulomb energies, so electron, electron, proton, proton, and electron, proton. All that's in here. And then we have three different types of functionals. We have electron exchange correlation which depends only on rho e. And for that, if we, we can just use what, what's already been derived, B3 lip, PBE, whatever your favorite functional is. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here, right? Those are all already exist. We have proton-proton exchange correlation, which depends only on rho p. And it turns out this is very, very small, because the protons are so localized. We've shown that it's like 8 or 10 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron, electron counterpart. And so we can just, uh, we really only need the diagonal Hartree-Fock exchange um, so we just include a Hartree-Fock exchange here. That, that's pretty easy. The tough one is this purple one, electron-proton correlation. And, and I think this is why the field kind of stopped in 1982 and didn't really go anywhere for a long time, because nobody had a good functional. But uh, Yang Yang joined my group in, in, around, in, in around 2017, and he developed the EPC-17 functional. That's in 2017. We also have an EPC-19 functional. These were modeled after the kolsov eddy formalism. I won't go into the details, but I'll just say that once we have all these functionals, we can use the variational method. We get two sets of equations, one for electrons and one for the protons. And that's, they look exactly the same form as the Hartree-Fock equations I already showed you. We just solve them self-consistently. And NEO-DFT, with these functionals, provides accurate proton densities, proton affinities, in optimized geometries. And you can see that on this slide here. For proton affinities, we looked at a set of 24 molecules. So we only treated the, the relevant proton quantum mechanically. And we get a mean unsigned error of 0.06 eV. If we do not include any electron proton correlation functional, we call that no EPC, it's much, much worse. I mean, it's terrible. It's completely um, you know, unacceptable. So electron proton correlation is absolutely essential. You can see that also when we look at the proton densities for FHF minus along the axis in perpendicular. Here, this black line is the reference. That's from a grid-based calculation. You can see that uh, if you have no EPC, that's this, this red dotted uh, uh, curve here, we're way too localized. And if you then add our EPC 17 or 19, you get much better proton densities in both directions. These are actually normalized in 3D space, even though they look like they're not, um, because I'm only looking at a 1D slice. We can also look at optimized geometries, and we see that quantizing the proton increases the FF distance in FHF minus by around 0 0.02 angstroms. And so we find that when we do NEO-DFT EPC-17, we reproduce that, that increase. You can see the black line here is our reference again. The dotted blue is, is our NEO calculation, and we're getting it pretty much spot on. So this is benchmarking showing us that this EPC-17-2 functional works, and it really shows how important electron-proton correlation is. 
I will say that Neo CCSD does very similarly on all these tests. I think the mean on site error is like 0.05 EV, so it's pretty much the same. The proton densities look very similar. So we're essentially getting Neo CCSD accuracy at this, at this point. But we can do more with DFT than we could do with CCSD. We have analytical gradients, we have analytical Hessians, so we can look, we can optimize geometries and we can get uh, transition states. So in this case, it's a hydride transfer. We treat this transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically, and we can generate the minimum energy path for hydride transfer from one carbon to the other. And what you see is that the barrier is lower with NEO than it is for hartree fock and that's because we inherently include the zero point energy of that transferring hydrogen, that lowers the barrier. But we can also learn something more about the physics of the problem. We can learn what nuclear motions are driving hydride transfer by analyzing the imaginary mode at the transition state and also the contributions to the intrinsic reaction coordinate. And we find that the, uh, that the uh, intrinsic reaction coordinate is dominated by the tetrahedral to planar rearrangement of these two, two central carbons here, we find that one goes from sp3 to sp2 and the other goes the reverse direction. You can see this picture of the, the imaginary mode down here. You can see those rearrangements happening there. Now, in electron transfer, right, you would have no problem saying what nuclear rearrangements are driving electron transfer. In this case, we're saying the same thing. We're saying, okay, the hydrogen is quantum mechanical here. So we it cannot contribute to the intrinsic reaction coordinate. The same way an electron does not contribute to the intrinsic reaction coordinate or to the imaginary mode of the transition state. So now we're saying these are the nuclear motions that are driving hydride transfer, the same way you'd view, you'd view nuclear motions as driving electron transfer. It's just a quantized hydrogen in this case. So it's really very similar a perspective. Now we can also plot the proton orbital and the electronic intrinsic bond orbital along the minimum energy path. And that's what's shown here. Purple is the proton orbital. It's going to be much more local you know, localized than the electronic one. And what you can see is as we move along this minimum energy path, you can see the proton and the electron are moving synchronously. They're moving together. And so we could imagine cases where they do not. In this particular case, they do. So that's the level of information you can get from this, the NEO method. Now we can also do molecular dynamics on the NEO DFT ground state. So we can just propagate Newton's equations of motion on the, the NEO DFT vibronic ground state. So now it's a vibronic ground state, it's not an electronic ground state. And this is a representative trajectory of that same hydride transfer. You can see the hydride moves from the donor to the middle to the acceptor. And we plot the expectation value of the hydrogen relative to the donor and the acceptor here. We can see it's moving away from the donor, the red curve, and toward the acceptor, the blue curve. We can also plot that planarity angle and see that indeed that is driving hydride transfer. So that's all fine and good, but what we're really interested in doing is excited states. We wanna, we wanna do photochemistry, right? So we need to get excited states so we can use linear response neo TDDFT. This is just looking at the linear response of the neo cone sham system to perturbative external fields, completely analogous to electronic structure, TDDFT. So our working equation just couples the electronic TDDFT, that's in these red squares here, with the protonic TDDFT, that's in these blue squares here. We have a bunch of matrices A, B, and C. C is coupling the electrons and the protons. All of this is, is in these papers. I'm skipping over all the math. But the idea is we can get the electronic and proton vibrational excitations in a single calculation. We also get vibronic excitations if they are linear combinations of single excitations. Now what we found is that by, by doing a lot of benchmarking with a lot of different molecules like FHF minus and, and even larger ones, that we can get accurate proton vibrational um, excitation energies, usually within 20 wave numbers. Occasionally they're a little bit worse. And you might say, well, as a spectroscopist, 20 wave numbers are not so great, right? But remember, that's 0.06 kcals per mole. So for a quantum chemist, that's pretty good, right? We're pretty happy with that. Now we can also, you might wonder, how do we compute vibrational frequencies that correspond to modes composed of both quantum and classical nuclei if we're treating only the protons quantum mechanically? And this was, you know, a bit of a challenge to, to address, but what we do is we generate an extended Hessian that depends on the classical nuclear coordinates, as you'd expect, but also the expectation values of the quantum proton coordinates. And this way we get the full Hessian, we can diagonalize that, and we get, we get coupled vibrational frequencies that include the anharmonicity of the quantum proton. So we do better than your regular Hessian, your regular harmonic approach. And here's an example of HCN. We get all of these different coupled modes. The, only the proton is quantum, but we, did, we generate this extended Hessian. 
just focus on the lowest, uh, the yellow highlighted uh, row of this table here, and you can see that uh, conventional harmonic calculation gets a frequency that's about 100 wave numbers higher than experiment. Not, not so unexpected. If you do a conventional and harmonic calculation, so you say VPT2, so second order vibrational perturbation theory, you, you get much better. If we just do our Neo DFTV calculation, again, just, just a single point uh, in, a, in a Hessian, we get spot on as well. So we've done this for many other systems, not just HCN. We've done it for systems with multiple protons, and we are getting this level of, of accuracy for the vibrational frequencies for, the, for anything involving one of the quantum hydrogens. So we are able to include the anharmonicity and generate, say, IR spectra. We also have analytical gradients for the Neo TDDFT. So we can get excited state geometry optimizations in 0, 0, adiabatic excitation energy. So what, what I mean by adiabatic excitation energy is we optimize the geometry in the ground state and the excited state, include the zero point energies, and we can then compare to experiment. Now, NEO TDDFT inherently includes the anharmonic zero point energy of the quantum protons, right, as well as the delocalization of the proton densities in the geometry optimizations. We can include the zero point energy of the other nuclei just from a NEO Hessian. And what we find when we look at these nine uh, molecules is the mean average, uh, the mean absolute error is a little bit smaller than it would be for regular conventional TDDFT. The largest error, it turns out, is actually in the electronic part. So we're not you know, doing that much better, but just a little better by quantizing the protons. We've also looked at excited state proton transfer. We've optimized all of these geometries for a single proton transfer and a double proton transfer. And the, and the general take home message is that quantizing the protons strengthens the hydrogen bonding interactions. The delocalization tends to strengthen the hydrogen bonding interactions in both the ground states and the excited states, but especially in the excited states. Now, in principle, we could do, say, surface hopping or air infest dynamics on those adiabatic uh, linear response neo TDDFT vibronic states, but it turns out there's a lot of uh, complications, a lot of technical challenges. So instead, we turn to real-time NEO-TDDFT. This is a collaboration with, um, with Xiao Song Li's group at University of Washington. So what we do is we say, let's start with this uh, product of an electronic and a nuclear determinant and plug it now into the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. All right, and then we can just propagate it numerically. So what happens is we get two sets of equations, one for the electrons and one for the quantum protons. And they're very strongly coupled, again, because the Fock matrices, again, both Fock matrices depend on both sets of coefficients, both electronic and nuclear. But we just propagate these numerically in time. And we can, in fact, compute electronic and vibrational excitation energies by just doing the Fourier transform, right, of the time-dependent electronic and protonic dipole moments. And we get agreement with the linear response neo TDDFT, which is good, we should, right? And, and that's already pretty, pretty um, accurate. But the advantage of real-time NEO-TDDFT is we can do non-equilibrium, non-Born-Oppenheimer dynamics. So we can do more than we could with linear response. So for example, this molecule here, we can photo excite it, say a pi pi star excitation to an excited electronic state. This proton now is being treated quantum mechanically. So I'm going to show you a movie of this. You can see the green and the blue here. That green and blue, that's showing the change in electronic density. This gray blob here, that's the proton. So all we're doing is integrating those nuclear and electronic equations shown on the previous slide. And what you see is that this, this hydrogen is not a point charge, right? It's kind of a blob oozing along here. So including this delocalization is actually important. And there is no Born-Oppenheimer separation between the electrons and this, this transferring proton, right? So this is dynamics beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So this allows us to do non-equilibrium dynamics of this kind of photo-induced proton transfer, but also PCET. Now here, all of the other nuclei are, are, are fixed. We can, in fact, let them move too. We can combine this with Ehrenfest dynamics. So we propagate those, those mixed nuclear electronic time-dependent Schrodinger equation um, numerically, these two, two equations we saw before. This is our quantum subsystem, right? Electrons and protons. And then we say the classical nuclei are going to move with a potential obtained from the nuclear electronic wave function, which is time-dependent, right? This is changing with time. So what we do is we can do non-equilibrium nuclear electronic dynamics beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation by including electron-proton non-adiabatic effects using neo-real-time TDDFT and including non-adiabatic effects between the classical and quantum subsystems by using Ehrenfest dynamics. And what you see here is we can then compare what happens when we compare our dynamics when we do Ehrenfest dynamics with a quantized proton, that's up here with, with neo, versus a classical proton, that's down here. 
And you can see if we look at these curves of the expectation value of the proton relative to the two oxygens, we see that they cross sooner for the quantum hydrogen than for the classical hydrogen. We can say that's where proton transfer happens. So proton transfer is faster with NEO. And if we look at the, uh, we analyze the trajectory, we see that the reason is that because the proton is delocalized, it can transfer at a longer oxygen-oxygen distance. So we plot the oxygen-oxygen distance as a function of time. And we see that for NEO, the NEO curve, we get, uh, it, 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 proton transfer happens at this purple line here at 2.57 angstroms. And for the classical one, it needs to wait for the protons to get closer because it's a point charge instead of delocalized wave function. And so that's why it goes, it goes slower. Um, for, the, for the classical case, and the kinetic ice stub effect is also slightly larger for NEO than it is for the classical. Again, this is a quantum effect. Now, we've also extended this to molecular polaritons. These are hybrid light matter states that arise from strong light matter coupling in cavities. Right, here's a nice picture of that. So Tao Li is a postdoc in my group, and he came and he said, let's, uh, let's propagate the real-time dynamics of a classical cavity mode, and you can treat it classically because it's harmonic, it's very harmonic. And then we do NEO for the molecular subsystem, real-time NEO TDDFT, because we need to quantize the proton, that's very anharmonic. And so what you see here is we've got our regular real-time NEO TDDFT equations, this purple shaded region, that's the extra term you need to couple either the electronic or the nuclear dipole moment with the, uh, the cavity mode, Q here. The cavity mode is moving classically. It's coupled to the molecular system through it, the total dipole moment of the molecular system. So we just have to do this self-consistent propagation of these equations. And this gives us a unified description of electronic and vibrational strong couplings. So we can then apply it to that same proton transfer reaction I showed before, the photo-induced proton transfer, where now we say, let's choose our cavity mode to have a frequency of that electronic excitation, that pi pi star excitation. And so if you look at the, uh, this blue peak here, that's that, that excitation frequency outside the cavity, so with the cavity off. You turn the cavity on now, and you get a Rabi splitting, you get the, because now this, uh, this excitation is coupled to the cavity mode, and you get the resonance uh, Rabi splitting that you'd expect. But we want to do more than spectra. We want to look at how does the cavity affect the real-time dynamics. So we put this molecule in a cavity. And so here are the uh, OH distances that I showed you before. This, these blue curves are outside the cavity, very similar to what you saw before. Now we turn the cavity on, and you can see proton transfer is not even happening, right? When it, proton transfer happens when these two curves cross. But the cavity mode can, in fact, slow down or even inhibit entirely the proton transfer. You can see it in this picture here where the, the cavity is slowing down the proton compared to when, when the cavity is off. So this tells us that these kinds of polaritons can, in fact, af affect the, uh, the chemical reaction rate. And quantizing this proton is essential for seeing this kind of behavior. Now, if we want to look at the deep hydrogen tunneling, we need to be able to describe bilobal delocalized wave functions. So we need a multi-reference approach. And we've done NeoCast SCF. It's expensive, though. If we want to do real-time dynamics, we need a faster method. So we were inspired by Jolly Gao and coworkers who developed multi-state DFT for electronic structure. And we said, hey, we can do NeoMSDFT to include dynamical and non-dynamical correlation in a computationally practical way. So what we do is we say, all right, let's do two NeoDFT calculations on something like malonaldehyde, right? We get two localized states, one on the left, one on the right. And then we say, that's the dynamical correlations in there. And then we say, all right, let's do a two-state non-orthogonal configuration interaction to mix these to get the symmetric and anti-symmetric bilobal wave functions. The energy difference between these two, that's the tunneling splitting. Right? So all we're doing is really diagonalizing a two-by-two two Hamiltonian. I'm not going to go through all the details of the matrix elements. It's very, very similar to what uh, Jolly Gao did, but it's now for a quantized proton. But we can then look at these tunneling splittings, and we did for malonaldehyde and also for an uh, asymmetric version, to be sure it worked. Uh, it doesn't only work for symmetric cases. We compared to a grid-based reference, and you can see we're getting within a few wave numbers, you know, within six wave numbers. That's really good. Um, at, at least in, in my opinion. And it's for only fixed symmetric geometries, though, at this point. And I want to emphasize that we do have to apply a correction to the overlap term, because we do have limitations because of our EPC functional is not perfect. And so what we did is we determined the parameters for that overlap, a correction for a very simple model at the beginning, and we did not tune it at all for any of these calculations on this, uh, this slide. So we, we were able to, it's very transferable. 
And here's another example of benzyl toluene where you can see that, again, the splitting for different carbon-carbon distances is, is reproducing the reference very well. So once we benchmarked it, we, we saw that things were working, we wanted to do dynamics. So we said, okay, let's propagate Newton's equations of motion for the classical nuclei on the Neo-MSDFT, vibronic ground state. And that's what's shown here of these OH distances. And you can see that we, we plotted the uh, proton densities that's shown in cyan here along the trajectory. And you can see it becomes bilobal, asymmetric bilobal in many cases, but it becomes bilobal showing that hydrogen tunneling is clearly happening here, right? But we're going to overestimate the proton transfer rate because we are not including the, the uh, contributions from excited vibronic states. And we know those contributions from excited vibronic states are going to be important because we actually generated the minimum energy path from alnaldehyde. So this blue curve, that's the minimum energy path. We started at the transition state and followed it down to reactant and product. And then for each geometry, we, we also plotted the excited state. Okay, so that's the purple curve here. And what's interesting is I thought it was going to have a minimum at the transition state. But you see it doesn't. It actually has a maximum there. And that's because at the transition state, the vibrational ground state is above the barrier. So it turns out that it's more like a harmonic oscillator, right? That's what these wave functions look like. It's at this point B on both sides, actually, um, of, of this uh, transition state that you have a slightly asymmetric bilobal wave function and you have a minimum energy splitting. And that's where you would expect non-adiabatic coupling to be large, and that's where you'd expect non-adiabatic transitions. And indeed, that's what we see if we do Ehrenfest dynamics, for example. So we take the wave function as a linear combination of the two adiabatics of the Neo-MSDFT states, so psi 0 and psi 1. These coefficients, C0 and C1, we propagate them with a the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. And then we say, let's just have the classical nuclei moving on an average surface. So the dashed lines here are the adiabatic curves. The solid lines are the Ehrenfest dynamics. Now, what I'm plotting here are the coefficients squared along that same trajectory. These regions where you're, they're clearly strongly coupled, those correspond to, if you go back to, uh, let's see, go back to here, right here, here and here, those two regions, that's exactly what we're seeing here and here. And you can see them if we plot the, uh, the, the, the Bilobal, asymmetric bilobal wave functions at 15 and 21 femtoseconds, you see that's where you've got this minimum energy splitting, and you can see peaks in the non adiabatic coupling. So this all makes sense. Now you might say, wait a minute, Ehrenfest dynamics does not describe branching processes properly, so we can do surface hopping. And so we can say, all right, we do the same thing with the in by uh, integrating these uh, coefficients with a time-dependent Schrodinger equation, but now each trajectory moves on a single trajectory. So for example, this is just a representative trajectory. And then we include instantaneous non-adiabatic transitions uh, using a method such as John Tully's method. And this is a sample trajectory. You can see that including non-adiabatic effects tend to slow down proton transfer in malonaldehyde. Now, we've also extended Neo-MSDFT to multiple protons. So we need two to the n states for n transferring protons. So here's formic acid dimer. And you can see these are the four diabatic states. We mix them. We look at the tunneling splitting between the lowest two and compare to a grid. And you can see we're doing pretty well. This is preliminary data. It's in progress. So these numbers could, in principle, change as we sort of polish up the code and everything. But without any, any parameterization or anything, we're getting pretty good results for multiple protons as well. We've also done NEO-MCSCF and MRCI. I'm not going to go into the details of this. I'll just say that it's, 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 again, preliminary data in progress. This is done by Chris Malvin. Um, the, uh, this, the, this one here was done by Joseph uh, Dickinson. And, um, what you see is we have, we have actually quite good agreement for HCN frequency you know, within a wave number, and we're doing pretty well on a hydrogen tunneling system. That'll probably get better as we increase our active space and as we, um, as we uh, increase our, do, instead of MRSCI singles, we also include doubles. So this is, this is still work in progress. We can also include the, di the uh, environment with NeoPCM, for example, a dielectric continuum that's been published. Neo QMMM, we have not published that yet. But what we see is the solvent environment can polarize both the electronic and the protonic densities. And we've done periodic Neo DFT. This is a collaboration with Yosuke Kanai and, um, and Volker Bloom. This is going into the FHI Ames. Everything else I've talked about has been in QChem. But uh, what we did here is we did TiO2 with water, with quantized protons. And what we saw is that the density of states is affected. By, by quantizing the protons. This is the difference in the density of states for neo versus non-neo. 
And you can see the well, there's shifts by 0.5 to 0.7 EV. This is, these are significant shifts. And we actually have real-time NEO-TDDFT working also in FHI Ames. So that's still, still underway. So hopefully I've given you a feeling for what we can do with this NEO method, that we can, we can use NEO wave function methods, like with the gold standard with C NEO CCSD triples. Or we can use a more practical method, SOS prime OOMP2. We can do excited states with EOM or CAS SCF. Neo DFT, we've seen how important EPC functionals are. We can use Neo TDDFT for excited states, MS DFT for hydrogen tunneling systems. We can get optimized geometries, minimum energy paths, and, and dynamics. And we can include the, the, the uh, environment with PCM and QMMM. And also, we can do periodic Neo DFT. If we want to do non born Oppenheimer dynamics, we have lots of options. We have real time Neo TDDFT with air and fest dynamics, or Neo MS DFT with either air and fest or surface hopping dynamics. And we've done polaritons. I think that's a fun direction that I, I want to continue to explore by adding a photon into the mix. And then we want to be able to study these, these complicated systems I mentioned at the beginning. And that's, of course, the ultimate goal. So we're still heading that way. We're not there yet, but I think we're, we're making at least some progress. And it wouldn't be possible without all of these people working very, very hard. And our collaboration, collaborators, Xiao Song Li and Yosuke Kanai, have been essential for those parts of the, of the um, of the projects, all of these, the people's names were on the slides when I went through them. So hopefully you saw them and um, also funding from these places. And I mentioned most of these methods are in QChem, some are in games, some are in Cronus Quantum and periodic stuff is in FHI Ames. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for this very impressive presentation. Uh, are there any comments or questions? Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate. Uh, I'm very excited to hear sort of what was the breakthrough in terms of getting this electron-proton correlation functional uh, on track? Yeah, so the breakthrough was I, I figured the cole salvetti uh, approximation would, would, would not work, you know, in our case. But it turns out if you start with an explicitly correlated wave function like they did. So cole salvetti was used to derive the LYP functional that's very popular, right, for correlation for electrons. But we had, to, we had to basically take into account that we have now electrons and protons. So our, our, our starting point was very different. We had a product of an electronic and a nuclear Slater determinant. We had to include that explicit correlation between electrons and protons and go through that and make, make some very um, Im important um, approximations along the way, but, but, but well-defined approximations. So I think the key one was that this, uh, um, where this term, this, uh, this sort of radius term, that was used for electrons was proportional to rho e to the, to the I think it was to the one third, that ours is now proportional to the rho e to the one sixth, rho p to the one sixth. And it was that actually that particular step that made everything else fall in place, that we had to realize that, that the size in some sense of the correlation, like a correlation size and effective size, uh, has to really be depend on both, 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 both the uh, electron and proton densities. And once we did that, everything kind of fell into place. So there's only three parameters, very similar to LYP. And those parameters were fit for, for model systems. And then it just works actually sort of much better than it should, which is very similar, I think, to B3LIP, which works probably better than it should based considering the approximations made. Yeah. So that was the big step. Thank you for this uh, impressive overview. Um, I I was wondering, there is um, the path integral method that is also used for accounting for nuclear quantum effects. And, uh, I was wondering if, if you could um, comment on the pros and cons uh, the in comparison to that. Uh, where do you feel are, are the advantages or disadvantages? Yeah, so most path integral methods are, 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 are not non-born Oppenheimer, right? They're, the path integrals are moving on, an, on a, a potential energy surface, an electronic potential energy surface. So if, you, if you're just in the ground state and you want to do equilibrium, you know, um, uh, nuclear quantum effects, then I think the path integrals are, are, are in some sense, are probably you know, better than what we're doing. They're very efficient and very effective. If you want, if you have non-born Oppenheimer effects, then I think this method will naturally include them between the electrons and the quantum protons. 
Um, there may be some ways to do that with, with path integrals, but I think that it, it, it requires additional approximations. Also, we can do excited states. If you want to do you know, photo-excited reactions that involve non-Born Oppenheimer effects in real-time dynamics, including all anharmonicities, right, I think that this method has an advantage over the path integral methods. But it's not really meant to replace the path integral methods. It's really, it's really being designed for different purposes, I would say. And in fact, we've even explored, we're actually exploring, uh, combining this method with path integrals for the other nuclei, because then the harmonic approximation is probably good for the heavy nuclei, but it's not at all good for the protons. So we can use NEO for the protons and say RPMD or something for the other nuclei and get maybe the best of both worlds. So that's something that we've actually, in fact, the code is all working and, and, and we've, we've actually got some results that are just not quite interpreted enough for me to say anything. But I think that's also a way we can get thermal effects and those sorts of things as well. And so. Um, so it could be that a mixing and matching might be the way to go in some cases. But it's really, I think, the idea of non-equilibrium dynamics, I think, sets it apart. And non-Born Oppenheimer, those would be the, the key elements. Leif. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, I wanted to ask about the detail here of your results. Uh, you were saying that the NEO method gave you stronger hydrogen bonding than the other uh, for some, several systems. And uh, how, how important is that effect for judging, for example, PCT reactions? The, if, if the actual, the new, new computed distances would actually be somewhat shorter than you have computed before for many systems? Yeah, so the donor acceptor distances are slightly shorter, yeah, than they would be otherwise. Um, I think it's going to be, you know, so that's just an overall effect. How that affects sort of the spectroscopy, you know, I don't, we don't really know yet. I think it, it will be more important for things, for dynamics. Yeah, when exactly. We're looking at the dynamics. Kinetic isotope effects. For kinetic isotope effects, 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 I think it will end up being important. Probably for things like with the triads, we actually applied this NEO method to it. And I think for things like absorption and emission spectra, probably not a huge effect is my guess. But when you're looking at isotope effects and then some of the photochemical steps, then I think it, it then that's where I think it will really matter. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just a, t a technical question here. So you do isotope effects, hydrogen and uh, deuterium, I presume. Do you right. have separate basis sets for, for the proton and, and the nuclei in, in the deuterium? Yeah, no, that's a good question. In principle, we could, but we actually just, we just scale it you know, by the, according to the square root of the mass, the way you might expect. So we, we, have, we have not actually specifically developed them for deuterium, but also our basis sets are sort of big enough that most likely even without scaling it, you actually still do pretty well because hydrogen, deuterium, the mass, you know, you, they're, they're still way different than, say, electrons. So, so you actually, these basis sets are, you know, we, we have these SPDF, uh, sometimes G, and, uh, but not too many of them, you know, sort of 5S, 4P, and these are, are not... Uh, these are, these are single functions, they're not linear combinations. So, um, you know, so far we have only just scaled them, I'd say. It, but then I think we've even sometimes not even done that. And either way, you get very similar answers, yeah. Okay, I, on one slide you showed a, I don't remember if it was CH, but it was some, some, uh, some uh, intermolecular vibration that you uh, said gave very good agreement with, with experiment. And you also compared with, a vibration or perturbation theory, right? I just right. wonder, so, but your, your own calculation was, or method was actually DFT based. So I wonder, don't you, you don't notice a systematic downshift because of DFT? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, so the, the, the um, my, my pointer is having a little bit of trouble today. I think you're talking about. Mm, it was a tape. That, yeah, yeah. You're right. Um, so yes, these were done with DFT, and you're right that, that in some cases this this particular one agrees very well for for whatever reason with the the V3 lip electronic functional. Yeah. Um, but you're right, and, so, and with VPT2 also agrees very well. But there the are cases, for instance, FHF minus. When we did that, it was terrible with DHT, yeah. D, D, DFT. You really need to use, and I think So Harada did some interesting work on that, where for FHF minus DFT fails miserably, especially for so the internal hydrogens. And in that case, you need like CCSD, maybe even with triples to really, to really nail that. And so we had the same problem, but we could look, we could find that the shift when you add anharmonicity was the same 
when you did NEO versus VPT2 in that case, but the absolute numbers were not in agreement with experiments. So you're right, not all of them are going to agree because DFT does have its own, its own error. And I think that was also the problem with the zero, zero adiabatic excitation energies is that TDDFT itself has errors because of its functionals and its, you know, approximations of linear response and so forth. So we can't, we're not going to do better than that, right? We, we, can, we, we can't, we're not going to overcome problems with electronic DFT and TDDFT with NEO. So we, we have to be realistic about that. And that's why we're exploring the wave function methods in parallel, because you know, for the absolute accuracy and systematic improvability, we're going to need those wave function methods, kind of the gold standard. But we also need the DFT methods to be able to move forward on some of the systems that we want to study. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I had another one. Um, I was wondering how, when you do photo excitation, you need initial conditions. How do you generate those when you have, I hear you're kind of extending to the extended Hessian, get the, uh, vibrational modes. Right. Um, are you somehow, uh, yeah, I, I'm just wondering how you yeah. sort of. So with this one here, what we did is, is we just did a homo lumo swap to get the, the, to get the excitation of, of pi pi star. I don't know if that's what you're asking, but to get our initial uh, excitation, electronic excitation for here, we actually just took the determinant, you know, literally moved, moved one of the electrons up. I, I was actually thinking about the, um, so in, in semi-classical approaches, you are needing uh, positions momenta. And I was just wondering sort of how do you do that in this setting? Um, oh, where do we put the protons originally? You mean yeah, the basis yeah. function centers? Ah, so. We can optimize, well, there's several different ways you can do that, but often we just optimize the basis function center variationally for, say, the ground state. Mm -hmm. So we would start out here, so you figure that it's, it's part of the variational procedure is to optimize the basis function center itself. Now, during dynamics, you have different options of where, what you do with the basis function centers. You could, in this case, we could put, say, two or three centers in between where we know it's going to go, and then, it just, and then the basis function centers are fixed and we, it just goes. The other possibility, we have a semi-classical uh, traveling basis where we, we move the basis function center according to Newton's equations of motion, just classical. And that also, and the, the two results give identical dynamics. So, and that's a little bit more efficient because you only have one basis function center. So you can move the basis function center with the dynamics. Um, so there's different ways of doing that. Or you can optimize it variationally. You know, so, so depending on what your goal is, you, you can do it in different ways. But that's a good question. That is something that's, that's very important, a technical detail that we've that we've had to grapple with. Yeah, because I, I imagine that, uh, so, so the part that I have a bit hard understanding is sort of when you include motion of the other classical, the classical uh, particles mm -hmm. as well. Um, because normally, I mean, right. if we so just Right, so when they move it, too, I, I don't have a movie of that because it gets too complicated, but when they move too, yeah, you have to, if, if they move too much and you have fixed basis function centers, then obviously it's not going to work. So typically they don't move that much on the time scale we're talking about, so you can still have the fixed basis function centers, but the traveling basis would be the way to go because then it's completely flexible. It can, as if the molecule moves or rotates, then the basis function center simply follows the forces that it's feeling in some sense. It's almost like a proton wave packet moving. Um, it is like, it's very semi-classical, uh, you know, semi-classically motivated. And so you actually do get the right physics that way. But these are issues that we are still kind of working, fine-tuning some of those. But that would be the, I'd say, doing dynamics, having the traveling basis function center is, is, is going to be essential. And for tunneling, if you have a bilobal wave function, you might need two mm -hmm. traveling basis function centers. So that is something, that's the one issue. But it, it's only one basis function center, so it's really not expensive. And to move it, it's just Newton's equations of motion for one more particle. So it's trivial, it doesn't add anything to the cost. It's actually very cheap. Hmm. Thank you very much. Okay, <coughs> thank you. And now we have four and a half minutes break. And before we take the break, we want to thank you again. Thank you. Thank you.